Man, I only want you to raise your hand if you know for a fact that he never leaves you and he never forsakes you. I'm looking for a single hand that's not raised because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he never, you know that for a fact. That's something that you can never take from me because of what I've been through. And in the, amen, sister, in the, in, in the depths of my heart, in the worst times of my life, I can honestly sit down one-on-one -on -one with you and I can say that in those moments, he was more real for me than any person or anything that when everyone else was not around and I was in inner turmoil and inner struggles to the very existence of who I am, there was Jesus. And he did works in my life, and I'm internally grateful, and I want for the rest of my days to serve him and honor him and bring glory to his name. And I feel like I just want to make, make it said that there's been uh, turmoil going on in, in, in lives and in people, and it's really a battlefield in the mind. <laughs> and I'm hearing lots of amens because we know this to be true. And you know, the Bible says to be aware of the tactics and the strategies of the enemy. And we are. And today, I bring in a word to you. And this word, is, it's found in the book of Luke. This story, you can, you can only find it one place in the Bible. They're the synoptic gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all tell stories like the 4,000. You, you, would, you would read and you could find that in different Matthew, Mark, Luke, because it's four different men telling the same exact story. And you may get small differences, but they're telling the same story. And this, this one encounter that we're going to read today is found in the book of Luke, and it's the only time that you'll find it in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere else. So we're going to get into this word in just a minute. But in doing so, I wanted to ask just a, a couple questions this morning. Have you ever had um, family come in from out of town and they don't have anywhere to stay or they may have to stay at some hotel or maybe they don't have money or whatever, so you invite them to come to your house and to stay with you? You guys done that before? I think we've probably all done that. And the thing that I want to kind of point out today is how much changes when that happens that, you know, the normal behaviors around the house, they, they shift. Thank you for saying that. That's a good way to put that. Because you have company in your house, that house atmosphere changes because there's someone there. And even in thinking about when you say, hey, you can come stay, you think about that room that they're going to be staying in, the living room, maybe the couch, maybe the whatever it is, you think, okay, I'm going to go to that room and I'm going to prepare a place for them. I want them to be comfortable in my house. I'm going to go into that bedroom. I'm going to get an, maybe you only have an air-up mattress. You get that. You put clean blankets on it, a pillow. Maybe you think about a nightstand there and a light, whatever it may be, because you're preparing for visitors to be in your house. And you want them to be comfortable in their stay. So in advance, you begin preparing a room and a place for your family to stay. And then you have them stay there and you know that they've gone to bed. And when you go to bed, you start thinking, well, I don't want to talk too loud because maybe they want to go to sleep. Maybe they don't want to stay up late. And then when you get up in the morning, the first thing that you do when you get out of bed is your, your feet hit the floor and you have this awareness that we have company companies in that room over there and it's an overall awareness can you feel it as i'm talking about it right now that feeling you know it you know that feeling because they are in the other room so where do you would normally get up in the morning and open the door and it goes boom it hits the wall you're going to go over there and you're going to grab the doorknob and you're going to open it up and you're going to close it and then when you start heading down the hallway, here's the room where they're staying, and you know that they're probably still sleeping. So instead of doing the, that you would normally just do where your heels hit the floor and there's a thud, boom, boom, boom. You're aware of the presence, that their presence is in your home. They may be resting. So out of honoring them, 
I'm going to go like this. I'm going to tiptoe past the bedroom, and I'm going to get into the kitchen. Have you guys done this? Like, we, you, you want to respect that they are there and that they can rest. So, and then when you get in the kitchen where you may normally open the refrigerator door and slam it back and put cups on the counter, everything you do, you're going to close the cabinets with, with ease. You're going to close them because you want them to be able to rest. Even, even things such as, like, getting in the shower and getting out of the shower begin to change where normally you might get out of the shower you put a towel around yourself and as you're walking down the hall it's flopping like this and you go from the bedroom from the bathroom to the bedroom that ain't gonna happen because you're hosting someone in the house and and so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take clothes in there and when you shower you're gonna put those clothes on and when you leave the bathroom you're gonna be put together because at any moment they could come walking out of that door Things such as watching TV in a pair of boxer shorts, scratching. <laughs> I'm just going to say scratching like this, okay? <laughs> but you know, those things right there, they're not going to happen. All of the normal body functions that go on while you're in your home, comfortable, belching, other things, it's not going to happen because you're hosting the entire, what I'm trying to get at is the entire standard of your home raises. We're going to be honoring. We're going to be respectful. We're going to be thoughtful before we do things because we are hosting family and we want them to be comfortable. And then here's another. You and your spouse if you get into an argument, it, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Knowing that they're in the other room, there's going to be no fighting, there's going to be no yelling, there's going to be no name calling. Because, I'm just, I'm saying the truth, this is not going to happen. It's something that, it's something that we would normally say, I just can't control it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I just couldn't do anything about it. But if we're hosting family, then we do something inside that says this is not allowed right now. And my question is this. Even, even in me saying these things, belching and bodily functions and walking down the hall on a towel, all those things, they feel even shocking, maybe a little bit uncomfortable because we flat out know they're inappropriate behavior when people are in the house. So if this is true, then I have this question. Why would we adjust our behavior so drastically to impress people and then not adjust our attitude and behavior when we are hosting the very presence of the living, breathing God who created everything, who we all acknowledge never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Not for one second. And it makes me think this right here. One of two things. Either we think that he's not in our home present or we don't care. And how sad is it that the moment we get out of bed and we put our feet on the floor, we think about Uncle Rufus and Aunt Judy or whoever it is that's in the home and how honoring and how respectful and how this is going to change what I do in the kitchen and how this is going to change how I walk down my hallway and how this is going to change. And then we host the presence of God in our homes. And I heard this testimony. Uh, another one of my favorite ministers, uh, Joyce Myers. Everybody knows Joyce Myers. Totally love Joyce Myers. She's won through her ministry millions and millions of people to the Lord. And the only reason I can share this testimony is because she shared it from the pulpit. And so I'm just uh, telling you what she said. But she had this message one time. She said that she was in her house and she was having a bad day. And she was... She said this was years ago in the ministry. She's not this way anymore, but she said she was screaming at her kids and 
just going off and saying all these things. And she said, right in the middle of the height and the climax of it, the doorbell rang. And it said she went over there and she, she looked to the people and she said it was her pastor standing on the porch. <laughs> and she said, you have never seen anybody get it together so quickly as I did that day. She said, I went from, I told you to do it. And she opened the door and she goes, Pastor, praise the Lord. And she said that she realized that day that the things she said she could not control, she got a grab on really quickly. And I wonder what we will do for people that we won't do for God. Isn't that the truth? But he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. When I asked that question, every hand in the room went up. That means that when you leave church today, he goes home with you. And I honestly believe from everything that I've read in the Word of God, everything is that our lives are genuine. That you are who you are here. You are who you are at home. That this is the same there's no difference that he lives in your home with you. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you will be saved in the day of redemption. So I, I, say, I asked this question this morning, and just you guys can ask yourself this question. If I or anyone in here could be a fly on the wall of your home for a week, would I, would I see a different version of you than I've ever seen before? I'm not saying that in a, it, it sounds bad. Or would I see the same person throughout that week? And, my, and, and, I, and I wonder this, sometimes do we treat complete strangers when we go to Walmart and walk down the thing and somebody absolutely bumps into us. Maybe a guy comes through and he just absolutely slams into you. And you go, hey, I'm sorry about that, man. I'm sorry. And you keep on moving. Do we complete, treat complete strangers better sometimes than we do our own family members? But the direction that the Lord is having through our pastors, it's us together, we, no eyes, together family growing together then the nucleus of what family is starts in the home starts where you live and so we've been talking about this and talking about your house and what goes on in your house but i want to take it just a step further than that this morning listen to what first corinthians three sixteen says do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So to be loving and kind at church is one thing, and then to be angry and hateful at home is a completely different thing. It's living two lifestyles at the same time. And the Lord says, I don't want them to be separate. Remember in the Bible when he says, he talks to them and he says, you, are like, you, you remind me of whitewashed tombs that are beautiful on the outside, but on the inside is dead men bones. And I hope and believe that as born-again Christians and followers of Christ, that we realize that we are carriers of the presence of God. That it's not just this in this temple, in this temple. Or when you go home, it's not just that temple. It's you. You host the presence of God and he cares what goes on. He cares what goes on in this temple, yes. We control ourselves in here. I don't see nobody. I've never seen anybody in here hit each other or call each other names. I've never seen that. We care. He cares when you go home and you walk into the temple. He cares what's going on in that temple. Take it a step further. He cares what's going on in this temple. Take it a step further. He cares what's going on in this temple this physical temple what your thought process he cares what's going on there 
The Bible says, let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. So this is going to bring us to our text today, and we're going to start reading and kind of unpacking this thing, but it's found in Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to read 1 through 3 right now. Reading it out of the New King James Version, and we're going to just start unpacking this thing as we go. It's, it's Luke 19, 1 through 3. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So in, in what this story tells us, it's giving us key information, and the key information is on purpose. It's for a reason. It's telling us things about Zacchaeus. This is what we know. We know that he's a chief tax collector. In this day, you, you may know this from reading your word, tax collectors were looked at like bank robbers, man. They were, they were scum. Nobody liked them. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. So you have the tax collectors that are going through the town and they're gathering the taxes from people and they are making a living off taking your money so you don't like them. Now Zacchaeus is the one that put them in place. He, he hired them and now Zacchaeus is making money from you, from the tax collectors and it's going in his pocket because he's the chief tax collector and it says that he was rich. Where'd that money come from? the people. And so it's giving us this information, and I wanted to share with you this thought, okay? That Zacchaeus is this chief tax collector that knows. He knows what's going on. He's been taking the money from the people. It's been making him rich, and he has come to a point where he's in the crowd this day, and he's heard that Jesus is coming through the crowd. And think about this. I've never, I've never considered this before, but Zacchaeus is standing with all of the people that he has done wrong to. And, and in his mind, he has to be thinking, the reason that I am rich is because of what I've done with all these people. And so he's standing there, and he is thinking about this. And I just want to ask this question this morning. Has, if anybody has ever done anything wrong, would you raise your hand? Look around the room. Lots and lots of hands. That's just a bonehead basic question, right? Why would I even say that? We've all done something wrong. But I want to, this morning, just run with me for a minute. I want to start like an onion. I want to start peeling back some layers and try to get to what I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to say today. There is a type of wrong that you do that you can go to a person and you can say, like, let's say I stole someone's $5 off the coffee table when they were my, my roommate or whoever it was. I take that $5, and then I, I put it in my pocket, and it's not that big of a deal. I'm walking. And then maybe later that day, I get ready to buy something with it, and I get convicted, and I say, man, I'm going to go back to them because, because of the, the I'm going to say the weight, which is light, of this offense. I can go to that person. Let's say his name is Mark. I go to Mark, and I go, hey, Mark. I want to let you know, man, um, I, you left this $5 on the coffee table. It's been like a month ago, and I grabbed it, and I stole it, and I put it in my pocket. And, but I, I got ready to spend it, and I'm convicted, and I want to say I'm sorry, and I want to give it back. There's that kind of wrong that is done to where that you can face the person face-to-face, -face, and you can say, I'm sorry for what I did. Then you peel off another layer, and there is a kind of wrong that you do that you don't want to go to that person any longer. Maybe it's something more serious. Maybe it's something more heavy, and you don't want to go to that person. Your flesh doesn't want to go to them, and so you don't, and you, you just stay away from it. And this is the kind of wrong that maybe you might go to a friend, like a really, really close friend, and you might sit down with them and you say, hey, listen, I did something. I knew I shouldn't have done it. I'm ashamed about it. I can't bring myself to, you know, and you confide in a close friend. And, and maybe they'll pray with you. Maybe they tell you to go make it right, whatever the case may be. Then you peel back another layer, and this is where we're getting at today. We're getting a shovel out, and we're digging. And there is a wrong that is done 
that you will never breathe to another human. And we don't like, we don't like talking about this because, but this is a reality. And a wrong done that, that you won't even go to your closest friend with. You're going to keep it. You're going to, and, and I want you to think about Zacchaeus in this day that he has at this moment where he has done so many things wrong for so long and he's standing among the very people that he's done it to until he is simply thinking that I am isolated from these people. I can't talk to anyone. Who could I talk to? I don't have anybody to talk to. And I, I just pray, and I have submitted my members to the Lord, and I, I, I'm really nothing at all except a servant of God who wants to please Him. And I'm saying this morning that I feel like I heard from the Lord that a person may, may not be everybody in this room, but there's somebody that feels very isolated and in this place that I'm talking about, where you cannot voice it to another human, that you will never, ever do that, I have very, very good news for you today. <laughs> that the Lord is meeting you there today. In this place. In that place of isolation. See, when he was standing there, he was thinking, I hope that Jesus sees me. I hope that he can. I hope that he can see me. And the Bible tells us that he was of short stature. And the reason that it says that is because in a crowd, he's going to be lost. And I'm just going to be transparent this morning. I, I think I've shared this one time in, in Square One possibly, but... There is a place, like I'm talking about, that there are things that go over in our minds, things that we can think, actions that we can do that we're not proud of, we may never mention to another person. And there was this one time that I was in high school, and um, th there was this, this girl in the class, and she was always mean to me and always made fun of me and just blatantly, out loud, would always do this. And, and one day, her and a friend, they... They devised this plan. It was messed up, Mateo. It was. They decided that when I stood up to answer the question, that her friend behind me, they were in cahoots, and that he was going to take my desk and move it. And he did. And then when I sat down, I tailbone right to the tile floor. And, the, and of course, everybody laughs. That's what high school does. Everybody laughs, and you know. And um, I'm just going to say this as truthfully as I know. When I got up, I picked myself up, and everybody was laughing, and she was really loving it right in front of me. And uh, so she kept turning around and laughing and looking at me like, you know, like that. And I got up, and I sat in my desk, and I remember the feeling when I sat back in my desk, and she was sitting right in front of me. And I had my pencil in my hand like this, and I was looking at the back of her neck, and I went like this. And, and I'm really too ashamed to say the rest of that. But you can imagine the thoughts. And I say that to say this, is that every person has the ability to go there. To go there. And when you go there, then you carry this. That's been 30-something years ago. I can still remember it right now like I did then. And a thought came to me that day was I did the exact same thing that Cain did to Abel. It was in my mind, man. It was there. And I've had to ask the Lord to forgive me for that. And, you know, in these moments, in these situations, I want to say this. If you don't hear nothing else out of this message today, hear this. Is that the one that created you is right there. Is right there. <laughs> He's right there with you. And he wants to sit down with you in those places when your best friend could not be trusted with the thought that you have. He wants to sit down with you and he wants to say, I can teach you a better way. I can show you what to do with those thoughts that you capture that thought. You make it obey me. 
Christ, you make it obedient. It doesn't want to be obedient. It wants to fly out. It wants to rage. It wants to do that. And he says, I will sit down with you, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and I will teach you step by step when no one else is around. I am with you. I will show you how to think my thoughts. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus and thinking his thoughts. And then something crazy begins to happen that even when you're wrong, you think well of someone. You pray blessings over their life. And the Bible says to bless those that spitefully use you. Isn't that a powerful thing? That sin isolates. And deep sin isolates you deeply. And I wanted to share with you that as Zacchaeus was in the crowd that day, he thought, if all these people knew how wicked I really am, They probably do. And he says, I hope desperately that when he comes today, he sees me. And he thinks about the lowliness of his condition. And he says, I have to do something. When he comes through today, I cannot jump a couple times and hope that I catch his eyes. I'm going to do something that I can justify, and I know that when he comes through, I will at least see him. So it says in Luke 19 and 4, it says, So he ran ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he knew that he was going to pass that way. So Zacchaeus climbs up in the tree. And the thing that I want to share with you today is that no matter the worst thought that you've ever had in your life, the enemy loves to go to work in that spot because it's so deep, it's so hidden. He knows that you're not going to go to people for help, and he begins attacking, and he begins saying things like, you know you're really not worth anything. You know the thoughts you think. You know you. Nobody else knows you. You're not worth anything. If people really knew how you are, and he goes to work in this part of your mind, and he begins attacking, and I want to share with you that of all the people in the crowd that day, of all the people in the crowd that day that Jesus could have talked to, that he could have came for, he went and he found this man in the tree, and he looked at him and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And this I know like I know my name. I don't know who it is, but I knew that this message is for at least one person in this room. That in the desperate places of your mind, Jesus is there for you. Not Not only is he there for you, I promise you, you're the one he's looking for. Standing in a crowd like I know you do, hoping from this low place that I esteem myself to be at. He's looking for you. You're the one he's looking for. And today I believe with everything that I have, (laughs) with this life that I have, I shouldn't even be here right now, but I've submitted it to him, and I believe that he is using me today (laughs) to find you. And I don't know who you are, and I look around the room and I wonder. I wonder who it is. I wonder how many there are. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me today because he's reaching out for you. (laughs) He wants you to know that he's there in that place, that you're not there alone. And he wants to teach you and he wants to mentor you how to take that thought process and give it to him. And I wanted to talk to you for just a moment about what the the sycamore tree, what the symbolism of that tree is concerning Israel. And I didn't know this prior to this, but the, the sycamore tree in Israel is looked at like a tree of regeneration, literally like someone being reborn. And the other thing that it stands for is repentance. And when Jesus was walking through the crowd that day and he's bumping into all kinds of people and he looks over and he sees a man up in the tree and he sees hunger in this man. 
There had to be hunger in Zacchaeus that day because he climbed a tree. He had to see him. And Jesus, what he looks at is he sees a man sitting in the seat of repentance. (laughs) He has a hungry heart for God. I have to see him. I'm going to do whatever it takes to see him. And the way that I'm going to get his gaze on my life is I'm going to sit myself down. My prideful ways, all of the things that I've been doing, I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to sit in a seat of true, authentic repentance, and I'm going to let his gaze fall on me. David said in Psalms 51, he said, My only type of sacrifice that is acceptable to you, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. That is, Amplified says, it's broken with sorrow for sin, thoroughly penitent, and such, God, you will not turn away. When God sees that, he says, I will not turn that away. Uh, Luke 19 and 5, we're continually reading the story of Zacchaeus. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And I wanted to say to you this morning that Sometimes when you're reading the word and you're reading through, when, when I read the words, I must stay at your house, they, they jumped. Because Jesus is saying so much there. He's saying, yes, we're having an encounter right here in public. He says, but hurry up and come down. I must stay at your house. It's like he's prophesying this goes deeper than what we're encountering. There, this thing about serving Jesus and walking with him is deeper than what you and I are encountering right here this morning. That this is not the end result of it. That he's saying to you this morning, I must stay at your house. I don't want this to be a visitation. I want to go home with you. I want to find a room that has been prepared in advance. And then because of my presence in your home, I want to see your nature change. I want to see you be mindful that I'm in your home, that you're hosting the presence of Almighty Living God. And I want to see you tiptoeing down the hallway because you honor me. I want to see you treating others respectfully because you honor me and you realize that my presence is in your home home and that I'm walking with you. I'm talking through you. You think those are your words you're throwing out. He's the temple that lives in you. He's in you. You're supposed to speak his words. You're supposed to have his demeanor. Be honoring and and gentle as you live in your homes, as you host the presence of God. Because he says, he doesn't say, I think I should stay at your house. He says, I must stay at your house. This is easy to do. Like I said on Sunday morning, it's easy, but when you go home and that person has gotten on your last nerve, I'm not talking about those ones where you got some left. I'm talking about that last nerve. And at that place, you say, Jesus, I, 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 with all of my heart, want to represent who you. I want to talk like you. I want to walk like you. I want to be like you. Revelations 3.20. There's a passage that it caught my attention, and I was just like, wow, I've never seen that before. But Revelation 3.20, think about this. Jesus, remember we're talking about Jesus says, I must stay at your house. I must. Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Who put Jesus outside? (laughs) Why is he knocking on the door outside wanting in? When he's supposed to live with us, he's supposed to be in us, abiding all of the time. Otherwise, I hate to say it this way, but otherwise what we're presenting is a, a, a double lifestyle. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branch. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my word remains in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Is there a situation or a person or a thing that can keep you from being remaining in Christ? And if the answer is no, then in those moments when it does get difficult, the words that come out of you ought to be words that say, I'm in him. I'm remaining in him. Because, let's be honest, some of the thoughts we might think about somebody when they do us wrong, those thoughts, if you ask yourself midstream, midstream you're having a thought about somebody, boy, I could sure, mm, ask Is that a thought that is in Christ? Am I remaining in him or am I letting my thoughts walk outside of his will? I know that this is like a heavy thing, but it's real. This is where we live. And he said, I must stay at your house. That's where you live. That's where you breathe. That's that's your life. That's not a show. That is the reality. reality. Amen. Psalms 91, 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Dwell means to inhabit, to remain, or to stay there. Luke 19 and 7, we're continuing the Zacchaeus story. It says, But when they saw it, this is the crowd, when they saw it, they complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And you know the answer to that is, yes, he did. Listen to Matthew 9 and 10. It says, Now it happened as Jesus was set at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And when you read that, you can see that that day that he was in the crowd and all these people around him, followers and believers, and he actually does the very thing that he said. He said, I actually came for that one over there in the tree. The one that you all hate and think he's so horrible, he said, I'm actually here today for him. And Luke 19 and 8, this finishes the story of, Luke, of um, Zacchaeus. 8 through 10 says, Then Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I have given half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. If I could have the worship team come back up at this time, I'm going to uh, say a few more things and I'm going to begin closing. When he went to the house of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus had was there and he he begins telling the Lord he said because I've met with you today everything about my life changes he said I'm going to give half of my goods away to the to the poor and he said and if I've taken anything from anyone I'll restore it fourfold one encounter with Jesus and everything begins to change and Jesus looks at him and he says today salvation has come to this house And then Jesus goes on to say, he says, today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. And the thing that I want you to know today is I don't, I don't care what condition you walk through these doors in. I know like my name, and it doesn't matter if it's one person. I know that this word was for someone today, and my heart goes out to you. 
And I want you to know that right where you're at in the condition that you're in, I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share this now. This is a very real thing for me personally. Because I was going to take my own life. And I know what it's like to be isolated. And I know what it's like to be alone and have secrets that you can't tell anybody. And you feel like you were away and you were in a corner. And that there is absolutely no one there for you. But I can tell you that it was in this moment. <laughs> I had been running some very, very terrible thoughts through my head, and I had been saying a phrase over and over again, and I'm going to tell you the honest truth. is the thoughts that I had been having had been wreaking havoc in my mind for like three months, at least three months, real, very real. And it's horrible, but the words that I kept saying was, I don't know how to shut this off, man. I don't know. I don't know how I can stop thinking I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't go to work. I'm having the worst time. And I don't know how to shut it off. And the enemy told me that if you put a gun in your mouth and you pull the trigger. And I cannot tell you the nights that I paced my floors saying those words. If I just do that, if I just put the, pull the trigger, man, I'd be... And I was at Bass Lake, California, doing a, a flooring install. And I wanted to listen to country music this particular day. Hadn't been eating, hadn't been sleeping. I was tore up from the floor up. And I went over to listen to some country music because the radio station would not come through. And I will never, ever forget what happened that day. Because I went over and I put my hand on the radio and it was real staticky. And I was going through the stations looking for country. And it came across this pastor. And he said from the radio, there's a young man that you've been saying to yourself that you want to put a gun in your mouth. And you're going to pull the trigger. And he said, this is not the plan of God for your life. but God and I stood there and I took my hand off the radio and I was I was absolutely exposed and naked before a living God who knew the thoughts and the intents of my mind to the most minute level and he said I am here with you and I don't know who you are <laughs> but I can say with every bit of conviction from my heart he is there for you he knows the thoughts. He knows the, the I'm going to say it, even, even if it's a murderous thought. <laughs> he ain't afraid of your dirt. He'll get in the middle of that situation, and he will change the circumstance for you. I make you a promise. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's how he does it best, is when you feel like you're in a place that you absolutely cannot get out of. He says to you this morning the very thing that he said to Lazarus. You know what? I'm going to apologize for the tears, man. I, I, I actually, I, I don't, this is not something that I can control. And I don't want to just be like the weeping prophet. and always come up here and I'm always crying and all this. I just do not have a defense for it. I'm being honest, man. And I wanna, I'm going to ask in just a moment, um, ask a couple questions, but I want to say who this pertains to today. If you feel lost or sick in any way today, I speak of mental sickness. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which is lost. 
And when you have mental sickness going on and mental thoughts, impure thoughts, that is a loss of purity in your thinking. And Jesus said, I have come to seek and save that which has been lost. Sometimes you can reach a point where you feel emotional sickness. And that is a loss of healthy emotions. And Jesus says, I'm here for that which has been lost to restore it. Sometimes there are sexual sicknesses where a normal way of thinking has been twisted. And it's a a loss in pure thinking. The Lord wants to save that which has been lost. He ain't afraid of you. You are not just another face in the crowd. And irregardless of how you walked in here today, feeling like you were just the, the scum off of somebody's shoe, I'm letting you know that he is here for you today. How many of you know that cutting is a sickness? We hear about cutting in the Bible actually when we look at the life of um, the man that was in the, in the cemetery. Legion. The Bible doesn't tell us his actual name, but it said that he was cutting himself. And a lot of times we could look at that and we say, man, that's a very extreme thing that somebody's really right at the very end before they start actually cutting themselves. But what things do you say about yourself? How do you think about yourself? Everything is not just in the physical, in the spiritual. If you are cutting yourself to the core, I'm nobody. I'm not going to amount to anything. I'm not. Then the Lord says, I want to restore a correct way of thinking. And he says to you today what he said to Lazarus. He says, don't forget, you're my son. That I actually came for you. No spiritual appetite whatsoever is a sickness. Anytime you lose your appetite completely, there's a sickness present. And the Lord says, if you've lost appetite, then I want to be there. I want to be there for you. I listed several types of sickness and the Lord without question wants to heal this area in you. And I don't know any other way to say things, but I feel like the Lord helped me design a special kind of net today, if you will. And that net is to keep, to catch people that are in very, very deep places. It's a specially designed net that is spread out and it is designed to catch you if you are in a very, very deep place today. Please do not run from this net that's being extended. I can get you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please. I want you to know before that I say this, that this is very, very... This is very dear to my heart. And I say this with all conviction under the Holy Spirit and His leading. And I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to come to these altars. But I am going to ask you that if this is for you today and you know it's for you, then I want you to lift your hand. No one looking around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I want to say thank you for those hands. Lord, you see these hands that were raised today. <laughs> Meet them where they're at, Father. 
I decree and declare right now over their life that you give them a hope and that you give them a future, Lord God, that you do for them what you did for me, that in those desperate, desperate places, Lord God, you're a friend that stays closer than a brother, that you put your loving arms around them in that moment, Lord God, and walk them out of the darkness right into the light. Holy Spirit, begin this, this very moment. I pray that hope begin to settle into your heart and into your life. <laughs> you know who you are. You raised your hand today. Listen to me. He's here to meet you today in that place. He came today looking for you. He came today looking for you. <laughs> Don't give up on him. Father, I thank you that you're no respecter of persons. That what you did for me, you'll do for them. If I could have everyone pray this prayer together today, everyone in the house, if you would, say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in the room. I thank you for your unfailing love. <laughs> thank you for ministering to those today, Lord God, that are in this place. I pray over their health. I pray over their well-being. I pray over their mind. I decree and declare that the best days are ahead for them. Father, I thank you for your unfailing love. I thank you for what you've done in this house today, Lord. I thank you that you're restoring and, and building and giving strength, Lord God. I pray over these that have raised their hand today, Lord God, <laughs> that every day they endeavor to find a sycamore tree. <laughs> I pray that a boldness come over them, Lord, <laughs> that says it don't have to look like nobody else. I don't care what the crowd thinks. I don't care. I have got to get to you, Jesus. For in you we live and move and have our being. Today, salvation has come to this house. And while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, I want to ask if there's anyone here today that needs to give their life to the Lord. If there's anybody here that would like to give your life to the Lord, if you want to recommit to Him, I want to provide an opportunity for you to do that today. Thank you, Jesus. Then in a way of closing today's service I'm going to read a passage from Ephesians 4.24 and I want to say this that if the Lord was tugging on your heart I'm saying this in closing if the Lord was tugging on your heart and you didn't raise your hand today but you know that was talking about your situation and you prayed that prayer with me then he's for you remember I said the type of wrong that you carry inside of you, you would never voice to another person. This includes you today that you couldn't put your hand up. You couldn't admit, you couldn't do that. The Lord's looking for you, you're included. And he says, because of our encounter today, Ephesians 4.24, therefore put away lying. 
let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put far away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. I just want to wait on the Lord for just a moment. say, when you say it, how you say it. Is Emma, Emma in the room? Is Emma, is Emma in here today? Lord, put Emma on my heart this morning. <laughs> Is this okay? Waiting on the Lord for just a moment. All I want to be is obedient. I really hope and pray that... Um, today's message. Uh, here she is, Emma. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, I just want to do uh, the Lord put you on my heart this morning. And uh, I wanted to say that he loves you. He knows what you're going through right now. And I'm not saying this because I know things because I don't. <laughs> but I saw you sitting up here today. He's on your... He's thinking about you and he cares for you. He has great plans for you. When you open your mouth, the anointing that comes out of your mouth can change generations. You know this about yourself. And he has a plan for you and the difficulties and the struggles that you're going through. He is there with you. He's going to lead you. He is going to guide you through every moment of that. God loves you. You're his daughter. And he's placed a calling and an anointing on your life that is not normal. <laughs> Lives are going to be changed. Souls are going to be saved because of your yes for the Lord. And I want to encourage you to continue and walk in that. Don't give up. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how dark it seems, walk forward because he's with you. He's going to be with you through every step in the name of Jesus. And I needed to tell you that this morning. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> it is my prayer that the Lord speaks to every one of you today in some way. So we're going to conclude this today. I'm going to say a prayer of closing, and then you'll be free to be dismissed. These altars are open if you want to pray afterwards. I usually find a place and 
thank the Lord for what he did. So let's, let's pray a, a closing prayer. Lord, I thank you for every single person that walked through the doors today. Lord, I pray in some small way through my obedience and trying to give and deliver your word, Lord, I pray that someone in this room's life could be changed. That you are there in the most desperate of situations. I say thank you for being there for me in my most desperate situations and that you're there for them today, Lord. For all of the hands that were raised in this room, Lord, (laughs) your heart reaches out grabs them by the hand and says, I'm going to walk you through this. So, Father, I pray a blessing over every person. I pray for strength. Lord, I pray over every person in this room, Lord, that we would determine in our heart every day to find a sycamore tree, to find it and get in your presence so that we can make contact with you, God. So, Lord, I thank you for your loving, caring kindness. Thank you for what's transpired in service today. I pray a blessing over every person, over their household, Lord. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that when we leave this building, we go home to the houses that you've given us and we honor your presence in that home. Let it change the very nature of who we are within our homes, within our heart within our thinking. Lord, I want to live and be above reproach in every area. Even in the deepest thoughts that I think, Lord God, I submit that area to you. Help me to think pure, walk pure, talk pure, act pure, and in every area be pleasing in your sight. And I pray that over every one of us today as we go, In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You can consider yourselves to be a...